Twist, you uh, probably guessed by now. Pooh Bear is Billy. Uh, <laughs> Billy. It's not. It's not. It's not Billy's mother. It's okay. Hey guys, my name's Dan, and this reaction comes from Dead Meat. This is Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2, 2024 kill counts. Now, it's no secrets that the first one wasn't really too great, uh, especially coming from my point of view. And with this movie in particular, I will say it was at the very least better than the first. But does that make it a good horror movie? We'll, we'll we'll dive into that as this video goes along uh, along with the, at the end i'll give my overall opinions on everything but i am curious to see how uh this movie was made because it's um it was interesting to say the least but before we get into it though please check all those links i have for you down in the description below more specifically the dead me link if you haven't already it's a great way to support the entire dead me team and a great and easy way to support me is to go right below this video click all those buttons down there because i'll let to see future reactions that i do but i'll just my channel to grow and without any further ado let's go Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the oh, victims and all our favorite the... horror movies and show you how they were made. I'm James H. Yeah, and today we're looking at Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey Winnie 2, the released in 2024. The first Blood and Honey received awful reviews, which were well-deserved. I did not like that movie. Still, it managed to make back almost seven times its budget, so production That's quickly pretty crazy. began on a sequel with more money behind it. To say it's an improvement would be like saying American Psycho 2 was a step down. This is unacceptable. Pooh 2 is a better movie in every single way yes, imaginable. Yes, it is. With better effects, a better story, and way, way better acting. The first uh -huh. film felt like a generic slasher where the killer just happened to be wearing a rubber Winnie the Pooh mask. Here, these so-called crossbreeds feel much more like the human-animal hybrids they're supposed to be. The increased budget goes a long way towards the original creature designs and some impressive gore. I still don't really like this movie. I would have preferred something campy and fun. For a Winnie the Pooh horror flick, it takes itself way too seriously. It I'm sure glad does. there's more of a story than just uh, chicks in a cabin, but most of the scenes fleshing it out feel rote and pablum. In fact, there's too much familiarity all around, with a lot of similarities to recent and classic horror movies. Even if they're coincidental, it feels stale. But there is actually plenty okay to enjoy this time around. Chief among them, Scott Chambers, who takes over the role of Christopher Robin. He proves to be very likable and shockingly good, especially yeah, when it he comes to amazing. conveying how much he's affected by social ostracism. I'd almost say he's acting like he doesn't realize what movie he's in, but he definitely does, since he also produced both Blood and Honeys under the name Scott Jeffrey. Way to go, oh. guy. I love it when people create their own that. opportunities to showcase their talents. Winnie 2 is way more graphic than the first film and has some flourish to the direction direction by Reese Frake Waterfield, who returns to continue his twisted childhood universe. There are a bunch of Easter eggs laying the groundwork for sure future is. TCU films, and if they're as good as this movie, eh, you know what? I, I think it'll be all right. Now, yeah, I think today, so. in lieu of a sponsor, I want to talk about Dead Meat. We have been having a banner year with at least one kill count every single week, but Dead Hell Meat yeah. is so much more than just kill counts. Over on Dead Meat Presents, our other channel, I host a Monday morning live stream every week that goes over horror news and Dead Meat updates. Dates. You'll hear all about the latest horror movies, games, and television series, it's while fun. also hearing our company's plans for the future. Plus, it's a fun hangout sesh that gets a little silly sometimes. See? Dead Meat Presents is also home to the Dead Meat Podcast, Chelsea's show that I co-host, which comes out every other week. We review movies, play games, talk about horror history, Lots sometimes more fun. do interviews. In fact, this Wednesday is an interview we did with Matthew Lillard. Holy Hell shit! Hell yeah, you dude! You don't want to miss that, so tune in to see it. Presents Love is also home Matthew to Lillard. interviews we get to do with other horror folk. Other series like They Talk, Production Tales from Hell, and What's Your Favorite Scary Movie, The Horror Royal Rumble every January, which is one of my favorite things that we do, mm -hmm, and The Dead Meat Horror Awards every spring, which is probably my favorite thing we do. We've also yep. got live streams Fair. of all varieties and plenty of other stuff, including new series we'll be launching in 2025. We also just launched our website, which has been in development for like over a year. The live stream audience knows. This thing is fully mm -hmm. custom. It was too advanced for us to use like Wix, mostly because of the movie search bar that lets you find any movie we've ever covered on that Dead is Meat too in cool, any man. capacity. That means kill count, podcast, Patreon reward, interview. Any film we've talked about can be found here. You can sort the films by decade, horror subgenre, 
what am I on Shutter? What's happening here? The kinds of content it has, all sorts of things. And the website will also help you find where you can watch the movie so you can fully enjoy it the is like Shutter. content. I mentioned Patreon, which is always a good way to support us. A single dollar a month gets you kill counts with all the gore unblurred and the sponsor segments removed for a more streamlined episode. Five bucks a month is a great deal. It gets you commentary tracks to watch alongside a movie and bonus audio only podcast episodes where Chelsea, Gressel, and I talk about non horror stuff. It also gets you kill counts a day early. Damn good deal. There are more rewards for $10, $20, and $50 a month, including a cameo like personalized video for me at that top tier. So check out what we have to offer and join the Patreon family if you want to. Finally, okay. at long last, our merchandise is back online. Show off your support in public with Dead Meat shirts and apparel featuring our logo. Even better, join the Dead Meat video crew with the black polo. Oh, I want that! The VHS franchise. I want that! And a lot more merch is on the way, so keep an eye out for okay. us. Okay! We're just glad to have it back finally. We've spent Me 2024 too. building things back up after an admittedly lackluster 2022 and 2023. We hope you've noticed and are excited for the other things. I am very excited. Store, because 2025 is when we break out with all kinds of new expansions. All right. Now back to the poo. Hell. How to help the domain protagonists <laughs> escape another sticky situation? Let's find out and get to the kills. Like a good self promo. The movie begins with a quote saying not to be a homebody. Go outside, step into some poo. We get another animated prologue with more solid narration that explains the fallout from the first film. The Hundred Acre Massacre, as it came to be known, sent shockwaves through the quiet community of Ashdown. Though Christopher Robin survived, he soon fell under suspicion for the murders, turning him into a Pooh Bear pariah, a little <laughs> like Halloween ends Laurie Strode. Still, some locals believed his tale and searched for the human animal hybrids by burning their way across this map, which I really love. This created a sort Pretty of good. Pooh Bear parallel. Unknowingly, both Christopher and Pooh were facing the same ostracism. Damn, Pooh looking like he has an H problem. <laughs> and I don't mean honey. Although he also has a honey problem. With Hundred sure. Acre Wood, now a Hundred Acre Fire, Pooh and Piglet, who they say survived, even though I counted him as a kill, rude, sought out other ha! friends, AKA other characters who have since entered the public domain. After that intro, we don't waste any time getting into it. We're already in the camper full of dead meat. Me and Jamie and Alice uh. are having a lakeside slumber party when Alice becomes our first victim by getting stabbed through the wall with a pole. The party animals have arrived. Pooh Bear slams the door on Jamie's hand, leaving her with some fucked up thingies. He's just really screwing with her vibes, man. Flipping their RV like he were a tiny home renovator. Props for actually doing this, too. I love stunts involving real vehicles. Same. Mia Jungle Jim's her way out, but Jamie gets stuck in, like, the saddest fire I have seen in Yeah, that, that wasn't yeah, was very good, was it? Freddy's dead, and that shit was made 33 years ago. Mia tries to escape on a golf cart decked out like that rickshaw on Monkey Man, but a bear trap roadblock stops her so Pooh can catch up. Clever. Oh, then we get an explosion. What a flex, considering that was the first movie's big finale. Pooh uses the trap to drag Mia away before Kurt- Well, that's what happens when you get more money involved. I'm stopping her remaining limbs one by one. It is brutal. He's hitting like at least an eight on the Art the Clown sadism scale. Mm -hmm. This whole sequence is way more effective than anything brutal. in the first movie. So it's good. So much more intense and sadistic. And wow, does Pooh look better. Remember that mask from the first one? Good God. That was the first thing that I saw when I was watching this. Because I was expecting to see this monstrosity again, but once I saw the face looked so much better, I, I was locked in. Although, new poo does kind of look like Stretch Armstrong wearing a muscle suit sometimes. A burnt up Jamie washes ashore just in time to see Mia kiss the bear trap and her life goodbye. Our first Bye -bye. new crossbreed, Owl, isn't pleased with Jamie's lack of kill graphic. How dare you try the molded monster pecks fun at her roasted marshmallow face. Ah. The abomination now. He's having a hoot as he grabs a nearby ah. log and plants it straight through her body, killing her. The whole <laughs> scene's a very loud horror statement to make, all done before the movie's title card. Yeah, you get it this time, guys. We catch up Yay. with Christopher Robin in a cozy therapy session. He lives in isolation with his parents, Alan and Daphne, and his little sister, Ella. My name is Bunny. Oh, sorry. All right, Bunny. all right, Bunny. Guess that little girl's already reading Mona a lot. Ella Bunny's built a Scary Berry to protect her family from Pooh and Pals. She used a teddy that belonged to Christopher's twin brother, Billy, who went missing several years ago. You know, every time one of these scenes with Christopher Robin starts to feel sappy or slow, Scott Chambers makes it worth it with his acting. He's got a cute relationship with his on-screen mm -hmm. sister. I might be like a little bit weird, right? Big bit. Big bit? Really? You are. 
Chambers took over the role of Christopher at director Reese Frake Waterfield's request, and he does a great job. Christopher's He's only wonderful. mates are his childhood friends Finn and Lexi, the latter of whom he's got a little crush on. He's hesitant to get too close, though, since being in his orbit makes them targets for 100 Acre Truthers. The cops don't have time to help deal with this petty vandalism. They're too busy investigating the camper casualties. One of them is played by Philip Filmar, last seen on the kill count as the wingman in Sweeney Todd. While they mm -hmm. try to figure out what's happening, a trio of locals set off to go a monster hunting in the woods. Wow, look at all these magic hour shots. That's, you know, that's great for them. Owl mm -hmm. sees them and brings the news back to a treehouse hidey hole, where he convinces their head Pumbaa to go on the offensive. He argues Pumbaa. they can't just hide and trust men to stay away. Never trust them ever again. Yo, what? Now you got Piglet talking? <sighs> that That's just weird, man. It makes him feel more like just a guy, you know? I dig have an owl as a mouthpiece, though, played by Marcus Massey, who was in the first film, Sans Makeup, as Colt. Actors Ryan Oliva and Eddie McKenzie take over the roles of Pooh and Piglet, respectively. They all seem to really get into their characters. Well, Owl is the wise one. Piglet was always one of my favorite characters, so uh, it's a dream come true to play the... the, the... <laughs> The little porky chap. With their upgraded budget, the filmmaker... <laughs> it's interesting to see him talking like that as a normal human being. ...has hired Sean Harrison and Paula Ann Booker Harrison to do effects. Their company, the Prosthetic Studio, has worked on the likes of Harry Potter and Star Wars. They did a full redesign of the characters and carried out a higher level of prosthetic work. Great work all around. Way mm -hmm. to improve. The Pooh crew makes moves on the shotgun-toting vigilantes. One dude, Shepard, goes to check out a noise, allowing his buddies to get attacked by Piglet. The group's leader, Daryl, manages to disarm the hog before a fuck off. Oh, shit! Bail! Blew Piglet's head off. And I guess I'll count it as a kill again? Even though, like, how can I trust you anymore, movie? The gunshot distracts Shepard long enough to receive a baseball bat beating. Then Pooh slits the Shep to shell him out to the count. As long as he doesn't sits up the chin. Pooh Bear attacks the other two, setting off Daryl's shotgun in his buddy's face. He then steals the boomstick and shoves it straight out through the top God of damn it, Daryl! The crossbreeds depart, but they're one kill graphic short, since the third guy, Aaron, is still alive. He manages to march his half-face to a clearing before collapsing. The next morning, Christopher's working his job as a nurse at the local hospital. This is me like a sharp little scratch. No. No, 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 you're gonna be good. You're gonna be good, okay? He's great with the kids, but that doesn't matter according to his boss. I've had complaints. About me. And with all this stuff that's happened around the horror film that's come out. Uh, the what now? Yep, the what? In the world of this movie, the first Blood and Honey is an in-universe film based on Christopher's testimony. Chambers compared it to the Stab movies within the screen frame. Ah, uh, yes, Isn't that makes sense. about your boyfriend? Yes, but it's all lies. I actually think this is brilliant. It explains yes, I do why too. he's played by a new actor and why the crossbreeds look so different. It keeps what happened in the first movie mostly canon, but explains away its shittiness by saying what we saw was a schlocky adaptation. Which is pretty cool way of saying, look, we know we messed up, Here's a better film, and I think they delivered with that. It's porn time. The hospital doesn't want the negative PR, so Christopher gets fired and given his traditional creepy severance stare. Man, what the heck is with that janitor? Go find out what color Miss Lippy's car is, dude. On Chris's way out, an injured hunter's wheeled in. Christopher recognizes Aaron as an old schoolmate. Uh, not sure how, given half his face looks like a Stouffer's lasagna. But since Aaron didn't die, let's find someone who will. Sure, a father bird watching with his son. Yeah, that works. The kid catches yeah, totally. an eye full of evil owl and scurries off while the dad is snatched like he were a passing shrew. We later see the crossbreeds littering his limbs into the river. Some of them look like they were made in Blender, but I will hand it to them. This overhead shot is pretty cool. <laughs> Christopher returns to therapy to talk through recent events. Though it's not spelled out in the movie, his therapist is Mary Darling, mother of Wendy Darling, the character from Peter Pan. Actress oh, yeah! Chris Adam is set to reprise the role in Peter Pan's Neverland Nightmare, which Chambers wrote and directed. Good for him. Mary tells Christopher to explore his unconscious mind, so he can learn the truth about Pooh. She uses metronome hypnotism to delve into his repressed memories, where we learn that Pooh actually looked like... <laughs> oh my god. That's what he looked like? Okay, I, I fucking love this Pooh. <laughs> Why does he kind of look like like squid billies? Young Pooh, which sounds like the name of a... <laughs> I did not put that together when I first thought, but I can't unsee it now. Rapper from 2006 was played by Peter D'Souza Feoni, who had already been in another horror film. He was in The Pope's Exorcist as the kid who gets possessed. Rob fucking Christ!
Turns out Christopher's stupid kid brain rose-tinted the grisly details and made all these memories happy. Then he goes a layer deeper and remembers the birthday party that his brother Billy disappeared from. After running into the woods together, Christopher saw his brother getting kidnapped in a van? Wait, are you serious, dude? We're doing full-on Five Nights here? This seems like a blatant Raglan ripoff, especially since they named another character Freddy. Babysitting that little shit Freddy the next couple nights. But in my interview with the filmmakers, they swore it was a coincidence. With uh, Five Nights at Freddy's, I was literally, when I, I saw the whole kid backstory, and I was like, oh no. <laughs> Blood and Honey 2 no! filmed in early <laughs> September, a full month before FNAF came out in October. So, as unlikely as it may seem, I'm inclined to believe them. Christopher yeah, talks I'll about his that. recovered memory. You gotta take them at their word. They, they did seem pretty genuine. So, I mean, could they be lying? Maybe, but there's no real proof to say that they weren't. Agree ...with his parents that night, who mentioned several other kidnappings happened around the same time. To investigate, Chris hits up a fake search engine named after Pooh author A.A. A. Milne and scrolls past a teaser for the upcoming Bambi the Reckoning. He finds a report on Dr. Arthur Gallup, a geneticist who disappeared after his home mysteriously burnt down. With all this info in his head, he's kept awake all night by bed flashes. It's almost like we hear the secrets that he keeps... <laughs> When he's tossing in his sleep. Elsewhere, the cops enter a tree like they were trying to get to the upside down. They finally found the crossbreeds dingy den slash build a dude workstation, which includes a decapitated head amongst the honey pots. A side door unlocks, revealing at least four more bodies hanging from the ceiling like this were Halloween horror nights. This room's been locked for most of the movie, and now we get to see why. Fuck it, let's bounce. That's my life. It's Tigger who slashes his way through two of the bobbies before running the last one down off screen. Ah. Blood and Honey 2 had 10 times the budget of the original, but considering the first film only cost 20,000 pounds, that's still not a lot. It was indie to the bone, man, with Frank Waterfield and Chambers wearing a lot more hats than they planned. This ranged from Frank Waterfield playing Tigger's hands for B unit close ups to Chambers having to take care of wardrobe when their set designer slash costumer dropped out three days before production began. So as much as stuff like that sucks to happen, you love to see people working on a movie, being so passionate about it, going that next level. It makes me respect this movie that much more. I was sat in a cafe until fuck knows what time doing 150 ravers costumes. No matter this movie's shortcomings, the important thing is how much these guys cared. The first yes. movie was Conveyor Belt Slot, one of 30 to 40 films they made within a single year. They took this sequel a lot more seriously and used their bigger budget to hire people You can tell. Help. You can't direct a film every two months and be as invested in the script and all of the different areas. To write sure. the script, they brought in Matt Leslie, who wrote Summer of 84. They had a frank conversation about the first movie's flaws, with Frank Waterfield reaching out to horror fans for specific feedback. Reese had really spent his time taking all the information in from the first film, like feedback from, from fans and just people from all these different websites doing polls, because he really was like, I just want to make a film that people are going to love. It's just like, for the people. Christopher visits Aaron in the I hospital. I can see that. He can't speak through his bandages, but lets Chris know he was right about the abominations. Christopher tries to get more out of him, but instead, Aaron unwraps his head to show off his 2009 Deadpool face. You know, the that time when he was the Merc without a mouth. It's almost yep. as upsetting as that janitor who keeps spying on him. Chris realizes the creep Stodian is the man he saw kidnapping his brother, but he vanishes before he can chase him down. Meanwhile, Finn is taking a shower when he hears a noise outside. He wanders into his euphoria-looking courtyard where he's jumping scared by Owl, who tackles him to the ground. The bird upchucks all over him, and it ain't baby bird food. It's nope. acid that melts away Finn's face. The kill is capped <sighs> off with a two-talon stab and an artsy showerhead shot that lasts, you, you know, just, just a bit too long. Christopher waits outside the hospital and watches the janitor punch out of his shift. He follows him back to his room with a view where he confronts him about the kidnappings. The janitor, whose name is Cavendish, reveals he was hired to kidnap the children to pay off his gambling debts. I never knew what he wanted them. But at that time, I didn't care. He was napping them kids for Dr. Arthur Gallup, who used them in his secret experiments. Combining human and animal DNA. Gallup ultimately hid his crimes by killing the kids in Hundred Acre Woods. When Cavendish saw what he'd done, he killed Gallup and burned his house down. Lots of murder being described here, but since it mostly happened off screen to characters yeah. we never met, I won't be adding them to the count. The All only one I will add is Christopher's brother, Billy, since we did see that little guy in a flashback. Cavendish buried the kid corpses, but came back later to find the graves empty. Six feet of dirt 
keep the crossbreeds down. The guy's been waiting for his reckoning ever since, so he hastens his ending in a way we're not allowed to talk about here on YouTube. Ain't that great? Boy, I nope. love babyfying our videos about horror movies. Yeah. After Simon Callow had previously appeared alongside Chambers and- it, it is frustrating, I know, but, you know, it's- it is what it is, I guess. 2023's Dr. Jekyll. He shot all of his scenes in a single day, which is insane considering he had multiple locations. Christopher scours over Gallup's notes and recordings, which are accompanied by cool animation as the doctor perfected his hybrid hypothesis. In other words, it's working. It's working! The tapes also ah. reveal that crossbreeds can regenerate due to axolotl DNA. All right, shout out to axolotls. Dr. Gallup is voiced by Toby Wynn Davies, who did the opening narration for the first film. Across town, Lexi is being a cool babysitter, like Vicky from Halloween 2018. Her charge tonight is Freddy, a horror movie obsessed little shit. Kids are running around like Jason in a Freddy sweater. It's like a horror version of Home Alone. Nah, that's that's better watch out. Winnie 2, ah. you're more like a, I don't know, sentimental terrifier? In any case, this kid's place is decked out with Pennywise clowns and, wait, is that Blade from Puppet Master? Or, or the Babadook? Oh, no, uh -huh. it's a jar of poison. Oh, oh it is. As is that. often the case, the babysitter hears a bump in the night. They hide in their conjuring tube tent and use their peninsula RV to see what's going on. Oh wait, yeah, I never got to do the peninsula episode. Damn you, copyright! They see ah. that someone's tracked Poo into the house, and he marches upstairs to do some damage. Lexi and Freddy manage to juke him and escape out front, where the cops are already waiting. Oh yeah, uh, Freddy's granddad is the officer from the RV site. It's all coming together, folks! Mm -hmm. The cops split up to search the house, but one officer gets hit with an ursine blindside. Poo proceeds to tear off her arm and beat her to death with it, ultimately stabbing her through the mouth with the arm bone. Wow, that kill is money, honey. Lexi calls Christopher to warn him that Pooh Bear's back, so he races off to protect his family. But Pooh's already at his house, uh, somehow, where Daphne's doing dishes while Alan and Bunny have a little crafting sesh. Alan is played by Alec Newman, who voiced protagonist Kaz in the horror game Still Wakes the Deep. Chelsea and I played through that whole ass thing on Dead Me Presents. Check it out. Now oh, God damn it, the plane! No! Daphne's loading the dishwasher like Stitches the Clown, which sucks, because Pooh Bear's here to chucky her onto the blades. Yep, he stabs sure does. the knives in further and then slams the mom down off screen. I love how invented they got to make this moment work. <laughs> Alan leaves oh, to investigate dope. the noise, but when he doesn't come back, Bunny goes downstairs and encounters the big man himself. Christopher arrives and rushes inside, where he discovers his parents' bodies in the kitchen, revealed through traumatic flashes. More prompts to Scott Chambers here, who fucking goes for it in every scene. Chris mm -hmm. checks upstairs for Bunny, but finds her missing, since she's been kidnapped by Pooh Bear. Huh, kinda like how Golden Freddy took Mike's sister. Now Pooh's stalking a scantily clad mm. warehouse rave with Owl. It's being thrown by Chris's childhood friends, Ava and Kara, who disinvited him earlier due to his status as a maybe murderer. This rave's got lots of people bouncing around and feeling the glow like Naomi. It's also got a bunch oh, yeah. of topless chicks, yet is somehow not really sexy at all. That's hard to do. Also, this scene mm -hmm. is flashy as shit for the entire duration, so, uh, uh, sorry, epileptics. Uh, you're just not allowed to watch this part, I guess. Pooh shows no, up and not. murders his first raver with a pull through the mouth. The dude's bunny playmate tries to escape in slow-mo, giving us a two-second summary of the entire film. Violence. Pooh chases her down Violence. and traps her head and yanks it clean off her shoulders. Oh, and then he grand slams it into a cloud of gore? All right, Pooh oh. Bear, respect. Pooh proceeds to Jeez, slaughter more here. party goers, but we don't see any bodies to count yet. That'll be a problem for later. Ava and some ravers get chased into a dead end. Huh, we're kind of doing Texas Chainsaw 2022 here now, aren't we? They're cornered by the ultimate bouncer. Hello, everyone. It's Tigger, whose face looks too similar to Pooh's for my liking, but at least he's wearing a straight jacket. That, that I'm, I'm okay with it. Him. He bounces around and begins his massacre by slashing one guy's throat before leaving another one's guts on the ground. One neon lady gets decapitated in shadow while a fourth feathered victim is plucked to death. Chris hears police chatter about the murders and heads to the rave with Cavendish's gun. He gets to the warehouse and steps inside to find... Ah, oh, shit. Is it later already? Yep. All right, hang on. We counted, I think, uh, 23 bodies here. All victims I think. of Pooh Bear's earlier rampage. Pooh's keeping the count going, too, with Kara and her friends in this flickering hallway. He pulls a Megan and goes quadrupedal so he can werewolf run the ravers down, then kills two with a spiked baseball bat. Another girl trips and falls, leaving her open to a As they do. Bashing. Back with Ava's group, Tigger's messing with one girl who's been blinded via ocular excavation. Better watch where you go. 
bitch. Oh yeah, Digger loves to say bitch. Come here, you fluorescent bitch. It's another place where this movie straddles the line between ripoff and homage. After all, Chucky's never shied away from that word, and it's no, basically never. half of Freddy's vocab. No, not that one. That one. Bitch. The comparison yep. grows more apt when Tigger drags his nails along the railing. In fact, all the abominations were meant to evoke classic killers. Winnie is the Jason Michael type, strong and silent, while Owl is more like the sadistic, loquacious pinhead. Piglet, meanwhile, is more like Leatherface, which makes me feel even worse for his short shafting, sweet boy. Anyway, yeah. the blind bunny can't see where she's going. I didn't actually realize that, but now looking back at it, that makes a lot of sense. And again, makes me like it that much more because these are horror movies that I loved and i still do so tigger leads her to an open trap door where she punks her way down to death wow i fucking love the way that dummy oh. fell that was, oh. that was fucking great ava tries to climb to freedom and spots tigger below another party goer he stabs the raver through the floor grate then grabs her by the uh dog leash yes, bitch. it's an homage to paris hilton's floor stabbing in 2005's house of wax tigger repeatedly stabs her from below giving him a refreshingly warm blood shower tigger wasn't featured in the first movie since he wasn't introduced until the second volume of winnie the pooh stories that book only entered the public domain in january 2024 freed the tiger to come aboard the sequel as a full-fledged killer he's Makes played sense. here by actor lewis santer in a mostly practical suit with the exception of his cg tail christopher searches the warehouse and comes across four more bodies in a bathroom stall it wasn't me he enters the main Tag. room sounding like he's stuck on a toilet of his own hey! he gets jump scared rex style when ava is tossed down from above it gives tigger a chance to sneak up on him but christopher responds by shooting his little tiger tongue ava tries to help out but she's finished off with a slash chris is blinded by the blood spray and wastes the rest of his bullets as tigger escapes from the scene and the movie. Chris runs off to look for Pooh Bear, who's currently killing another party goer with a face punch. Yep. Kara and the surviving ravers tried to hide from Pooh, but one idiot hops into an industrial furnace like he were trying to find a sawtooth syringe. That goes just about as well as you'd expect, yep. since Pooh winds up being the homelander to his bought scientist. Ah. Now we're doing tool stuff, I guess, as Pooh kills one girl with a power drill lobotomy. I mean, why not? It's there. The bit. Then he pins another chick down and severs her head with a hacksaw. He did just tool time faster than Pamela. Ah. <laughs> when he kills Kara by ripping her head off with his bare, bare hands. Pooh Bear grabs a nearby chainsaw and heads out for a showdown and... Oh, uh, alright, I guess we're in the woods now. Christopher confronts Pooh. Where is my sister? But in response, Pooh attacks him with a chainsaw! What? what? Oh, what? another what? flaming chainsaw! What? what? The Mandy-style burning blade kicks off some many <laughs> that Christopher only narrowly escapes. Lexi is all of a sudden here since she's been tracking Christopher's location. Um, talk about an invasion of privacy. There's another layer of stalking too, since she's been getting tracked by Owl. I can see you, you witless bait. The big bird flies away, and, well, he, he never comes back. Yeah, I don't know where he goes. He just kind of fucks off for the ending, I guess. Chris is chased through the woods by Pooh, who's doing his best Leatherface impression. He manages to corner Chris, but stops short when he sees a nearby open grave. It's where Cavendish buried the murdered children, and a symbolic standoff finally confirms the twist you, uh, probably guessed by now. Pooh Bear is... Billy! Uh... <laughs> It's not, it's not, it's not Billy's mother. It's okay. Billy? Yeah, Billy, you know. Christopher's First brother. brother. He tries to appeal to his twin's human nature, <laughs> but there's no going back. Ah, I love the fact that he's continuing the reference that scene even now. That's so great. Damn. Christopher saved last minute by Lexi, who takes a piglet back ride on Pooh. He tries to force Lex onto his still running chainsaw, but Chris interrupts with the axe he just found. As he charges, Pooh says his final and only words. You left. Wait, dude, fuck yeah! That's literally exactly what I asked for last time! You have him say one thing this whole movie and it's not, oh bother, it's you left? Man, I take it all back. This movie is actually perfect. Christopher that. leaves Poop Billy's head in half and the bloody bear falls back into his old grave. Lex comforts the grieving Christopher and leads him out of the woods. They run into some approaching cops who happen to have found Bunny. That's convenient. Brother and sister reunite and the movie ends as the trio's taken back home in the squad car. A mid credit scene reveals Owl has collected Pooh and Piglet's bodies and taken them back to their forest hideout. Using some regenerative Honey, Owl plans on growing his buddies back for the sequel. We'll all be back for you, Chris.
Christopher Robin. Those sequels and crossovers are hinted at in the credits, where we see Rabbit, Pinocchio, and Peter Pan. They even take a group pic in Sleepy Hollow. Wait, except for Piglet? What, did they, did they make him take the picture? Oh, little guy really gets shafted in these movies. Aww. Did Pooh 2 prove too cruel for the residents of Ashdown? Let's find out and bounce to the numbers. Boingy 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 boing. Whoa, 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 James! Damn, I'm gonna make a mess. 66 people died in Blood and Honey 2, with the victims consisting of 26 males, 33 females, and 7 unknown thanks to the rave and those body bags. This is a massive increase in kills compared to the original, and ties it number-wise with a single other kill count, Jordan Peele's Us. With a runtime of 100 minutes, Winnie 2 had a kill on average every 1.52 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to the blinded raver girl who fell through the trap door. There are bloodier kills, obviously, but sure. I love the physics and sound effects of that dumb oh, thing railing. It's so good! Double Sunday for Lamest Kill will go to Alan, who was killed off screen with a body flashed by too fast for us to really see. And that's it! Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey 2 was released in 2024, and just like the original, turned a massive profit. This time I'll say, good for them. Till yes. next time, I'm James H. Meese. This has been the Kill Count. On the next Kill Count. One year ago, during uh -oh. the forgotten weird era of dead meat. Uh oh. <laughs> Zoran Gavoyich did the first ever comic book kill count oh, for snap. Freddy versus Jason. Oh Martin yeah, that's Jack. right, that's right. Because it's Drew, what they say. There are no original ideas left. And James told him if it ever got over one million views, it did, did it. Would cover the sequel. Hey, hey, let's go. Just we figure out a way to read <laughs> Freddy versus Jason versus Ash, the Nightmare Warriors. Then on the Friday before Election Day, witness Freddy's bid for president with the kill count. Uh, only on Dead Meat. And there ain't a thing any of you can do to stop me. Ha 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 um, I guess you could say my expectations going into this movie were extremely low, which probably uh, helped in my enjoyment in it. Uh, just seeing everything revamped the way it was, uh, the acting so much better, the twist so much better. I mean, everything was just so much better than the first. It was really hard for me to, even when the movie was not great at times, I was able to not really mind it as much because sometimes when you're enjoying a movie regardless of what it is and it's you're having a good time with it if there's a part that doesn't seem too great or the acting isn't too great in a particular scene or something is off about one particular scene you tend to overlook it due to everything else that you have going here and then even learning more about how this movie was made how all the people who were involved in it had were wearing so many different hats during the entire movie that shows their dedication to it. And whenever people show any sort of dedication to anything, it makes me enjoy the movie just that much more. And that is definitely, definitely a good thing. But that will do it for me here. Comment down below. Let me know what did you think about Winnie the Pooh? <sighs> Blood and Honey 2, please leave a like if you enjoyed it. Check all of those links I have for you down in the description below. Then lastly, and most importantly, I want to give a huge shout out to all my $5 and over supporters on Patreon. Cruising, Wolverine 310, Kester Cronage, Joshi, Chris Curtis, Ann Perry, Foscophony, Misa, Misa 2, Lily the Snoopy Fan, Lauren, Jenny the Swifty, Allison the Aesthetic Girl, Flea Street Vicomp, Emily the Flower Lover, Steffi, Sophie the Sunset Girl, Summer the Dog Lover, Misa 3, Arrow Hamster, Inca Linquist, Aubrey the Charlie Brown Lover, Thomas Shawanowit, Carter Resnick, Noah Mowdy, Kamu Bathia, and brand new paid supporter Sam Nang, thank you all so very much. And if you too looked out a shout out and in each and every one of my videos, please head over to patreon.com slash for more. And I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>